Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, I have to start uh, today with the very sad news that we have received confirmation in the last 24 hours that a home care worker in Western Bartonshire has died with COVID-19. And I want to take the opportunity today to convey my thoughts and my condolences uh, to their loved ones. Uh, their death, of course, is a reminder that people working in our health and care services are not simply showing immense dedication and expertise, although they are. They are also displaying great courage. And I'm sure that everyone in Scotland, once again, is reflecting on the considerable debt that we owe each and every one of them. I also want to say a brief word this morning uh, about Boris Johnson. Uh, one of the things about the COVID-19 virus, of course, is that it does not discriminate. It can potentially affect anyone and everyone. The fact that the Prime Minister is undergoing tests is a further reminder of that. And I want to take the opportunity on behalf of the Scottish Government and I'm sure on behalf of all of the people of Scotland to wish him all the best. Uh, we all hope that he makes a very speedy recovery. And I want to uh, take a moment to introduce uh, Dr. Gregor Smith, who joins me here today. Uh, Gregor is a GP and a former medical director for primary care in North Lanarkshire. He has been deputy chief medical officer for the last five years and has been closely involved in the government's work on coronavirus. Following Catherine Calderwood's resignation last night, Gregor has agreed to act as interim chief medical officer for the foreseeable future and will say uh, a few words after I have finished. Um, it is fair to say that this has been a difficult 24 hours for the government, but I am acutely aware that that is as nothing compared to the difficulties faced by those who contract COVID-19 or whose loved ones get it, or indeed the health and care staff we are calling on to treat them. Supporting and helping them will always be our chief priority, and that has my and the government's total focus. As usual, I want to update you today on some of the key statistics in relation to the progress of COVID-19 in Scotland. Uh, first of all, I'm able to confirm that as at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 3,961 positive cases confirmed. That is an increase of 255 from the figures we reported yesterday. And as always, let me be clear that these numbers will of course be an underestimate. A total of 199 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected cases of COVID-19. That is an increase of two on yesterday. And a total of 1,599 patients are currently in hospital with COVID-19. That includes those in intensive care. And that is an increase of nine uh, from the figures I reported yesterday. Also in the last 24 hours, there have been two uh, further reported deaths of COVID-19. That takes the total number of deaths in Scotland now to 222. Uh, once again, however, as I uh, said yesterday, uh, that figure will not give a, a true account of what has happened across Scotland over the weekend. As I explained yesterday, our new system for reporting COVID-19 deaths use information validated by National Registers of Scotland. Work is underway uh, to move the NRS system to a seven day a week operation. As a result, the figure I'm reporting today, like the figure I reported yesterday, will be artificially low, although I do want to stress that each death matters and is a source of sadness to family, friends, and also, of course, to us. Uh, these figures will be reconciled tomorrow and on Wednesday. And I can also confirm that on Wednesday, the National Registers of Scotland will also publish a report on deaths in the community as a result of COVID-19. We expect these figures will confirm the trend that we have seen over the past 10 days or so of a rapid increase in the number of COVID-19 cases in Scotland and also sadly the number of deaths. And unfortunately, there is almost certainly worse uh, still to come uh, before we turn the corner of this virus. And so I want to summarise today some of the key steps we are taking to prepare health and care services and to protect our health and care workers. Uh, two weeks ago, we established a nationwide network of community hubs and assessment centres to triage and treat individuals with worsening COVID-19 symptoms. We also asked people to no longer contact their GP with COVID-19 related concerns. And it is maybe worth stressing that for most people, the NHS Inform website should be the first place to go for advice on COVID-19. However, if you need to, for example, if your symptoms worsen, you should call the NHS 24111 number. 
For non-COVID-19 related medical advice, contact your GP practice. If your GP practice is closed and your medical issue can't wait till it reopens, then you should also contact the 111 number. On the first day that we introduced our new system, NHS 24 received almost 12,000 calls to the 111 number. That figure has been slowly decreasing. Uh, we had just over 4,000 calls on Friday, although of course there are still peaks, for example, at weekends. And on the figures we have available, approximately 5% of telephone inquiries resulted in a 999 call being placed. A further 65% uh, resulted in the caller being referred to a treatment hub and 30% resulted in the caller being advised to look after themselves at home. This system is ensuring that people get the best advice in the safest possible way, putting the fewest people at risk and its benefits are being felt across the country. Uh, we've also quadrupled our testing capacity to around uh, 2,000 tests per day. Uh, that will increase further in the weeks ahead and started to make testing available to our key workers. By the beginning of this month, health board estimates suggest that approximately 5,000 NHS workers or family members had been tested and we expect the numbers uh, tested to rise considerably in the days ahead. At present, and I know this is an issue uh, that has been raised uh, by many, just under 6% of NHS Scotland staff are absent from work as a result of this virus. And finally, we continue to prioritise the delivery of personal and protective equipment, not simply to hospitals, but also to care homes and to carers. Health Protection Scotland published revised, revised guidance last week on when and how PPE should be used. The NSS social care call line, which helps care service providers with urgent equipment needs, has been running now for two weeks. In that time, as I uh, mentioned previously, more than six million pieces of personal protective equipment have been delivered to more than a thousand care homes and other locations across the country. And more broadly, we are in close contact with the Care Inspectorate to understand how COVID-19 is affecting the delivery of care across Scotland. We've also set up a dedicated contact point for frontline professionals to raise any concerns they might have about the availability of PPE. Uh, finally, and briefly, I have three other items uh, to update you on today. The Scottish Government has been working on how we address drug and alcohol misuse with our Drug Death Task Force and a number of other organisations, including the Scottish Drugs Forum, Scottish Families Affected by Alcohol and Drugs and Public Health Scotland. Today, we're providing funding of £166,000 to support those with drug and alcohol issues. Amongst other things, this will fund a publicity campaign helping people to know where they can get support during this pandemic. And it will improve access uh, to naloxone, a medication which reverses opiate overdoses. We know that times like these, which are difficult for everyone, uh, at times like these, people though, will need uh, help to deal with alcohol and drug uh, related problems. And we want to make sure that that help is available. Uh, the second point is that uh, an additional £8 million has been made available to help third sector organisations. Amongst other things, it will enable them to provide emergency accommodation for those who might otherwise be homeless and also to distribute food to families and individuals who might otherwise be going hungry. And finally, we will this afternoon publish further guidance for the construction industry. This guidance, which has been developed with Construction Scotland and the trade unions, maintains the Scottish Government's commitment to the precautionary principle that construction sites should not be open unless they are actively contributing to the health and well-being of the nation. The final point I want to make is simply to underline once again that although these updates set out what government and our partners are doing, Tackling this virus remains a job for every single one of us. The decisions we all make about keeping our distance, about mixing with other households, and of course, about staying at home, except for essential purposes, will help to determine how rapidly the virus spreads and how well we get through this. I do not underestimate how difficult these restrictions are, and I know that they will seem harder as the weather improves and as frustration inevitably sets in. That will be particularly true for families with children. But they continue to be crucial. Doing the right thing and staying home is the way in which we can slow the spread of this virus, protect our National Health Service and save lives. So I want uh, once again today to thank everybody who is helping us do that. 
Um, and I will now hand over to Dr Gregor Smith, who will say a few words uh, before I hand over to the Health Secretary. Thank you, First Minister. I want to begin today by just paying tribute to those health and social care staff right across Scotland who are contributing so much just now. Um, there is an incredible amount of work and commitment that which has been displayed right across our staff um, across Scotland just now. And I wanted to record my personal thanks to each of you. I've had conversations over the course of this weekend with clinicians from various backgrounds. And I think it's really important that I continue to get a sense of what it feels like as you're delivering care out there uh, just now, and, and that I can take your experience and the wisdom that you're able to give me uh, about that experience into how we develop things further. I wanted to highlight again to the people of Scotland that the NHS is there for you just now. It is open, and if you need it, it is important that you try to access it. There's been much which has been said around about how we should respond if we have symptoms which might be COVID-19. But we mustn't forget that actually people get ill for other reasons as well. And my strong encouragement is to you that today that if you're experiencing symptoms that are worrying you, particularly worrying symptoms like chest pain or um, new symptoms such as a new type of bleeding or lumps that you're discovering, please do not hesitate to contact your NHS in the way that you normally would. It's really important that you continue to get the care that you need at the time that you need it. Um, and, and, and that you don't ignore these symptoms and simply put them off. GP practices across the country remain open, and although you may see there is a different type of service that you get from them and different ways of contacting them, it's really important that you don't ignore these symptoms. I also wanted to highlight to you, as First Minister has outlined, the new assessment centres and hubs which are um, running in the community. One of the GPs that I spoke to at the weekend described his experience of working in a, a hub in Inverness. And what, what he described to me was a very controlled environment where people were able to manage the volume of calls very, very well and provide advice to people at the time that they need it. The majority of people who develop COVID-19 will have mild symptoms. Again, I want to emphasize this. And most of you who develop symptoms such as cough or a fever will be able to manage your symptoms very easily at home using advice from the NHS-informed website. But if those symptoms are deteriorating or if they become prolonged, it's important that you're seeking further advice. And you can do that very, very easily by phoning NHS 24111. When you do that and when you access those uh, people at the other end of the phone who are there to help you, they will guide you through the process as to how you can be properly and fully assessed. And some of that will take place over the phone or perhaps even by some of the new methods of video conference. And where it's necessary, some of that will take place in person so that you have a proper physical assessment as well. But please be very, very clear. If you have symptoms that you're concerned about, I do not want you to sit at home worrying about them. I want you to seek help about them. There are many, many ways that you can access that help. And my advice to you is to take advantage of those. Your NHS will remain here and open for you at all times. Thank you, uh, Gregor. And I'll hand over now to uh, the Health Secretary before taking questions. Thank you very much, First Minister. Can I also start by recording my thanks to everyone working in our National Health Service and our Social Care Service for the considerable amount of work they've done. As we've said before, our response to COVID-19 requires a huge effort across all areas of health and social care. And this morning, I want to say a bit more about all those individuals who've come forward as retired health professionals or as students in uh, health uh, care to offer their services to our National Health Service and to social care. As of this morning, 12,725 people have come forward to offer their skills and expertise during the coronavirus outbreak. These numbers are, of course, over and above doctors and other health professionals who may come forward as a result of the work of the professional regulatory bodies. In terms of breakdown of that almost 13,000 individuals, 1,370 have registered with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, 1,700 with NHS Lothian, and the remaining 9,655 have come through the dedicated NHS Education for Scotland accelerated recruitment portal. 21% of those are nurses, 24% nursing students, 
10% doctors, 13% have experience in social care. In addition, we have people coming forward who are physiotherapists, biomedical students, occupational therapists, dentists, midwives, paramedics. A whole range of individuals stepping forward to offer us their much valued and much needed care and experience. Depending on their specialism, there are different plans in place for students in particular to carry out paid employment in the NHS, whilst also being able to complete their qualifications. New recruits joining the service on fixed term contracts will be entitled to maximum sick pay entitlement, the same as staff with five years service. PVG and disclosure checks are being fast tracked so that we can get the benefit of those new recruits as soon as possible. That response so far in a relatively short space of time shows the incredible dedication of our healthcare community, current, retired and future, to give us all of their skills and expertise to help us meet the challenge ahead and to help us deliver the highest quality healthcare. And they have my deepest and most sincere thanks for doing so. Okay, thank you, uh, Health Secretary. I'm now going to go to questions. I've got a large number of questions today. So, um, again, I would appeal to journalists if your question has already been asked, uh, please uh, don't feel that you uh, need to ask the same question again and we'll get through as many as possible. Firstly, uh, Kieran Jenkins from Channel 4 News. First Minister, how many care workers have been tested? Um, I don't have that uh, figure right now. As I've said before, we are gathering uh, more data on testing and we intend to make uh, more data available over the course of this week um, about the numbers being tested within all of uh, the priority areas we've set for testing, which includes key workers, and that will not just be care workers, that will be uh, NHS workers. So we are undertaking to make as much of that information available as quickly as we can. But as I've said all along, when we put information into the public domain, we want to make sure that information is robust and it is reliable. Uh, there will be information on a range of different things published uh, over the course uh, of this week, more information on the number of deaths, more information uh, on the breakdown of some of these figures and uh, more information on testing. Uh, can I go to I Peter? First Minister, Sorry. because they say we speak to workers inside care homes and they say they can't get tested and well, PPE isn't reaching them and well, they're very worried about themselves and their patients. Can I say I, I absolutely understand the concern of uh, people working in the care home sector. Um, I understand that concern generally. I particularly under that understand that concern in the wake of uh, the developments, uh, tragic developments at the Burlington care home over, over the weekend. I've talked uh, already today in my statement about the flow of PPE and I would say to any care worker we have set up an email hotline for any worker in health or social care who feels that they are not getting what they need to address that and we will make sure that is rectified urgently. But there have been millions um, of uh, pieces of equipment already gone to care homes and we are working hard to make sure that distribution and that flow continues. On testing, I've been very open uh, and candid about the priorities we set for testing and the need to build up uh, the, the capacity of testing in order that we can test uh, more uh, workers. Uh, there has been a focus in terms of key uh, worker testing on the NHS to try to get people back to work. But as we build up the capacity, we'll be able to test more people. And that's why that is such a, a priority area of focus for us. Uh, if I can go now to Peter Smith from ITV News. Hi there, First Minister. Um, yeah, just I'm, I'm aware that you're very keen to move on from the events that happened over the weekend there. And in the interest of doing that, I would want to ask you, how much damage do you think has been done uh, to your public information campaign? We are hearing a lot of people saying, well, if the chief medical officer or the former chief medical officer doesn't believe that these rules are really a matter of life and death, then it's not really that serious. So what are you going to do to repair that campaign? And also in the interest of moving forward, a big question mark is about trust and also a question mark over you and your government's handling of this. I just want to ask you to clarify, we, we heard that on Saturday night, you spoke to Dr. Calderwood um, when these allegations came to light. There was then a statement given by your government to the people telling the people in this country that she essentially went to her holiday home as a one-off, uh, essentially to secure the property. We then heard the next day that that wasn't true. She clarified in the media briefing that um, she'd been twice seemingly for leisure purposes with her husband and her family. So getting to the point here, on Saturday night, 
either she didn't give you the full truth of this, and then when you found out before that media briefing on Sunday that she had not given you the full truth and you could not trust your chief medical officer on the gravest of issues, surely you should have, should have sacked her on the spot. The alternative to that is that she did give you the full truth and then your government didn't give the people of this country the full truth when they said that she'd essentially gone as a one-off. There is a big question mark over trust here, First Minister. Someone somewhere in your government wasn't giving the people the full truth. I would like to ask how seriously you're taking this and what you're going to do about that. Uh, look, I, I take all of these issues seriously. The, the line that was issued uh, on Saturday night reflected the information we had at the time, a couple of hours after the query and up against a deadline of the reason for her visit uh, to her house in Fife uh, that weekend. Uh, she later clarified that she had been there the weekend before and she made that clear at the briefing uh, yesterday morning and, and was open about that. Now, as we said yesterday morning, the reasons for her being there, whatever those reasons uh, were, uh, were not actually important because they did not provide a justification uh, for her breaching uh, the guidance and the advice that was in place. So uh, that is the, the situation. Um, I, in terms of the first part of your question, I am acutely aware uh, of the importance of the advice that we're giving. And, you know, I... I've been candid. I hoped that I could continue to have the advice of the Chief Medical Officer. More than one thing can be true at once. She made a serious mistake um, and in breaching that guidance, but she has also given valuable advice to the government over the course uh, of this epidemic. Um, but it became clear to me last night that that was not possible without damaging the trust in and confidence in the government's message. And that is the most important thing. The Chief Medi Medical Officer was wrong to visit her house. And you know, my uh, statements and, and my continued statements to the people of Scotland will be that this advice is being given for a reason, uh, because it is the way that we help to slow the spread of the virus, protect the health service and save lives. Um, and we will continue to prioritise uh, the vital importance of that advice and ask people, uh, understanding the difficulty of complying with it, but asking people to do that for the right reasons. Uh, James Matthews from Sky. First Minister, uh, on the back of that answer, are you confirming that far from Dr Calderwood resigning, you sacked her? And what does it say about your judgment that you didn't sack her 24 hours before? Um, we had a conversation last night, um, and my view last night, uh, having reflected on the events and the developments of the day, is that it was not possible for her to remain in office without potentially damaging the trust in uh, and confidence in the government's message. And that was a view I came to. I discussed it at length with her and it was a view uh, she agreed with. I have set out why um, 24 hours later, uh, as you say, I thought she had made a mistake. Uh, I thought she had to apologise for that mistake. Uh, and I thought it was absolutely clear that we weren't trying to defend that in any way. Uh, but that Nevertheless, the advice she had been given to me was important. It is not ideal as First Minister in the midst of a, a virus outbreak like this to lose my Chief Medical Officer, the, the Chief Medical Officer of the government. And uh, I uh, wanted to continue to have her advice, but I came to the conclusion it was not possible to do that without risking uh, the government's message, which is why uh, we came to the view last night that it was the right step for her to resign. Uh, Lisa Summers from BBC Scotland. Lisa Summers. Yes, hi there, First hi. Minister. Um, you mentioned uh, earlier that Health Protection Scotland has revised its guidance on PPE at the end of last week. Now, we've seen a document that also says that Health Protection Scotland has said that COVID-19 is no longer classified as a high-consequence infectious disease. Now, one doctor we've spoken to says that this is bonkers, and he says it's confusing and contradictory and is misinformation, and it's leaving staff on the front line confused about what level of PPE they should have. Can you give us some more information about why that has happened? I, I'm not sure what document it is you're referring to. I am happy if we can look at that after this briefing and give you clarification on that. The uh, advice that was issued by Health Protection Scotland at the end of last week was advice that had been agreed on a four nations basis with input from experts and Royal Colleges, and that is the advice in terms of the appropriate PPE uh, for different staff groups to wear in different circumstances that should be followed. But I'm, I'm very happy to look at the particular document you're talking about and make sure that we give clarity on what that means uh, and its relationship, if it has a relationship, uh, to the advice that HPS issued. 
Uh, Fiona Walker from BBC Radio Scotland. Hello, First Minister. Um, as we know, people are missing funerals. Their uh, children in flats who are not able to use their play parks. Um, you've talked a little bit about the damage to the message, but I wondered if we could ask the interim chief medical officer what his first steps are going to be to repair that trust. Good. So I've been very consistent in my messaging to the public and the opportunities that I've had right from the beginning is is, is that. Um, it is incredibly important that the whole population of Scotland plays its part in making sure that we, we, we save lives. And we can do that very, very simply by, by adhering to that message of, of, of staying home unless it's absolutely critical that, 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 that we go out. And um, I think that that consistent messaging and demonstration of that messaging, actually the responsibility on all of us, uh, to, to participate in that is, is really, really important. And certainly from my team, um, the, the, the behaviours that um, I expect of all of them is, is to model those very behaviours that they're asking of others. The key here is to make sure that um, the, 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 the social distancing measures, difficult though they are, that have been put in place, have their intended impact on the way that we will reshape the, the, the kind of numbers of people who are able to, to kind of contract COVID-19 over the coming days, weeks and months. And, and it's only by just scrupulous self-discipline that, that we pursue those uh, that, that we're actually going to make that, that, that big difference in the longer term. Thank you. Um, Ross Govins from STV. STV, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me first? Minister? Yes, I can hear you now, thanks. Yeah, sorry. You, you mentioned uh, the, the changes in the way that death figures will be reported. Uh, just how much of a large spike should the Scottish population be preparing itself for in the overall death rates in the coming next few days? Um, I'm not going to speculate, Ross, um, on the exact uh, quantum of that, uh, but there are two things over the next couple of days uh, people should uh, be prepared for, and uh, I think I've said before, we intend to do uh, a separate briefing in addition to the daily briefing uh, with journalists, uh, I think tomorrow, just so that there is a, a full understanding of the differences in, way, in the way that we're reporting death numbers in the future. But the, the first thing is there'll be a reconciliation uh, tomorrow uh, and Wednesday of the figures for uh, that I've announced today and yesterday because of the fact that NRS is not yet operating a full seven-day service over the weekends in terms of the uh, death certification process. Uh, and let me stress that that is for uh, confirmed, laboratory confirmed cases uh, of COVID-19. So the numbers I've announced uh, yesterday and today of two deaths on each day, all of those tragic uh, are nevertheless uh, going to be underestimates of the figures uh, for the weekend and we will see that feed through into the figures uh, that we report uh, over the next two days. The second uh, change is one we uh, flagged up last week and this will be published on uh, Wednesday where NRS will publish on a weekly basis uh, deaths that have happened uh, in the community that have not got a laboratory confirmation that are presumed uh, COVID-19 uh, deaths where a, a doctor has put it on the death certificate. So we will see an increase because that is capturing um, a, a category of people who have died that we have not been reporting so far. So uh, that's uh, the changes that people should expect. But I don't want, obviously, to speculate without knowing what these numbers are likely to show in detail, uh, exactly what the quantum of the increase is likely to be. And we'll set that out uh, very clearly on Wednesday, as I say, with the uh, briefing, uh, hopefully tomorrow, uh, about the process and the methodology uh, for journalists so that in advance of that, there is a full understanding. Uh, Lindsay Hanna from uh, Radio Clyde and Forth. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, there's confusion from some cancer patients who thought their operations would not be cancelled when the other elective procedures were. However, we've now seen a letter from a patient in Fife who was due to be operated on for prostate cancer this month, and that's now not happening. He was diagnosed in July last year and is obviously concerned that his cancer may spread and become worse. Do you have any updated guidance for other patients like him who are waiting to have an operation to remove their cancer? Well, we, we've been very clear that the urgent uh, treatment should go ahead in the NHS. I, I'm not 
obviously going to comment on a specific case when I've not uh, got all of the details of that. We would, of course, be uh, willing to have uh, a closer look at that if we had the details. But I hand over to the Health Secretary who will say a bit more about uh, how we're managing capacity in the NHS to make sure we are able to deal with uh, the virus, but also ensure that urgent treatment uh, takes place as people would expect. So we've always said from the outset that whilst we are looking to create bed space inside our NHS estate, we do that by uh, pausing our, primarily our elective care work. But the urgent care, uh, trauma and maternity care should remain and be prioritised in our hospital setting. In terms of some cancer patients, the clinical judgment, the individual clinical judgment may be that the risk of the operation in circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic is too great against the risk of postponing the operation for some time. So whilst we certainly can't comment on individual cases, it is always a clinical decision as to whether or not an operation in any circumstance goes ahead or not. And I would hope that when those clinical decisions are being taken, there is the fullest possible discussion with the patient involved so that they understand what their situation is, the reason for that, and what they should expect to happen in the days and weeks ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tom Eden from PA. Thanks, First Minister. Um, I just wanted to ask what consideration you gave uh, about appointing a new, deputy, uh, new Chief Medical Officer with a more virus-based background and expertise. Well, at the moment, um, for me, we will obviously have uh, a recruitment exercise in due course uh, to uh, replace Catherine Calderwood. At the moment, the importance for me is as much continuity of advice uh, as possible. Gregor, as Deputy Chief Medical Officer, has been uh, integrally involved in the development of our response uh, so far. Uh, but of course, we continue to take uh, a wide uh, range of advice from uh, different scientific uh, expertise, and it's important that that continues. But the consideration, uh, of course, to uh, a longer term uh, replacement will uh, happen as soon as we get to a point uh, in the uh, development of this virus uh, that we think uh, we've got uh, the ability to consider that properly. Uh, Kieran Andrews from The Times. First Minister, on the um, death of the care at home policy. I'm not really hearing, I don't know whether you're volume. Sorry, is that any better? Uh, a little bit, yeah, please shout. Okay, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, on the death of the care at home worker today, was that person, do we know if that person had been provided with the correct PPE equipment uh, and, and what is being done to get visors, goggles? in particular, which we know schools are making to order, what's been done to get that to the front line? And then just briefly on the CMO yesterday, have you checked with your other advisors and ministers, and are you confident that no one else has taken or will be taking trips to second homes in the future? Um, I absolutely expect all of my ministers, all of my advisors to follow uh, the advice and the guidance that is there. We are asking the public to follow that. There is not one rule for us and one rule for other people. It is vital that we all uh, do the right thing. I'm going to hand over uh, to the Health Secretary on the issue of uh, distribution of PPE to carers um, and, and the front line. Uh, on your specific question about the home care worker, that is obviously uh, one of the things that we will be uh, seeking to establish, uh, but obviously I'm not going to go into any more detail uh, about the specific circumstances of that right uh, at this moment. Jean. So two things to say. The first is that we have currently adequate stocks of all items of PPE that would fall under the clinical guidance that was reviewed and issued last week. Uh, that covers uh, everything from uh, gloves to aprons to the face fit uh, mask and visors. Orders are continuously being made and we are modelling the stock levels we have against demand to ensure that the orders that we are placing uh, will meet the demand that is current and the demand that is forecast. The second thing to say, as the First Minister made clear and we uh, made clear last week, is that we have now introduced uh, a direct distribution, ordering and distribution line for all social care provision, both care at home, care homes, carers, personal assistance to individuals uh, who will be able, with that clinical guidance, to directly order what is needed and the distribution line to them is direct now, as it is to primary care and separately to hospital care. And we have, as we've said before, 
that direct uh, email address for people to raise individual concerns. It is monitored continuously and it has ministerial oversight in order to ensure that we can respond quickly where people are raising concerns about the supply of PPE to them as an individual or to their area of work. Okay, Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. <clears throat> Um, I just wanted to ask on Dr Calderwood, will she receive any sort of payoff after departing her position? And also, what are you going to do to revamp the public health information campaigns on TV and online to rebuild public trust following her departure? Um, I'm not going to comment on terms and conditions of somebody who has uh, resigned. Uh, if it is appropriate, then the Permanent Secretary will uh, issue uh, information about that. Um, we had already yesterday taken steps to begin to uh, replace the adverts with Dr Calderwood uh, with others, and, and that work is ongoing. And that work will take the opportunity uh, to reiterate the uh, vital importance of the advice that we are giving people. It's really tough. It's really hard. I don't underestimate that. But staying at home, apart from essential purposes, is vital uh, for your own sake, for your family and community. And that's why we're asking you to do it. Uh, Tom Peterkin from the P&G. Um, First, First Minister, you, you, you said in um, good afternoon. You said in answer to Kieran Andrews that um, you expected all your team. Um, government uh, politicians and uh, officials to abide by the guidelines, but are you aware of any that have flouted, any others that have flouted the guidelines? Uh, I want to be very clear about that, but let me be uh, take the opportunity again uh, to make clear to everybody, uh, regardless of who they are, regardless in what walk of life they are in, that it is important that everybody uh, abides by and complies with this advice. Uh, Michael Blackley from the Daily Mail. Hello, good afternoon. Um, you said that one of the main factors for Catherine Calderwood's eventual departure was the, the concern that her actions might undermine the message of the, the lockdown. Um, do you have any concerns that your decision making on this might have led to the public losing trust in your own judgment on some of these lockdown measures and your, your response to it? Uh, well, uh, I certainly hope not. I will continue to do what I have been doing, is be candid and open with the public about why I'm asking uh, you to do the things I'm asking you to do. I will continue to share the information I have and be uh, frank when there are questions to which I don't yet uh, have answers. Um, and I'll be uh, candid as well about the difficulty of the judgments and the decisions that all of us are being asked to make at this time, all of us in uh, leadership positions and in positions of government. None of it is easy, none of it is straightforward, but that's my job and responsibility. And I will continue to make these judgments in good faith to the best of my ability. Uh, and always putting uh, at the, the forefront what is best to equip me and the government and the country to get through this challenge as well as we possibly can. This is not a normal political situation. Uh, if it had been, then, you know, perhaps the kind of things that a politician usually thinks about in these circumstances of, of news management and spin would have been to the forefront. Those weren't issues at the forefront of my mind yesterday. What was at the forefront of my mind was how, firstly, I continued to make sure that I had the best advice to enable me to deal with this virus and also how I ensured uh, that the confidence of the public in the advice that we are giving them was maintained. And those were things I was weighing up throughout the day. And as you know, I came to a view last night that the chief medical officer had to resign in order to make sure that we maintained uh, that confidence. So uh, I'll be uh, open and uh, candid with the public about the reasons I take decisions. Uh, and I'll always seek to do that with the absolute uh, interest of giving us the best chance of fighting this virus at heart. Uh, Christine Lavelle from The Sun. Uh, First Minister, um, how much did the Scottish Government spend on its public information campaign featuring Dr Calderwood, which has now been withdrawn, um, and who do you plan to front the new revised campaign? Um, I don't have the cost information to hand. Uh, the information's been, the campaign has been running for a number of weeks now and it's been important and valuable that it has been running uh, in order to get that message across. Obviously, when we have uh, new adverts to go, then uh, we will be uh, making clear to the public uh, the content of them and, and that is something that will become apparent uh, in the, the very near future. Um, the, the cost information, I don't have to hand, but of course we can provide that later on. Uh, Vivian Aitken from The Daily Record. 
Government First Minister, um, you said today there was 199 um, patients in ICU. Can you tell us today how many of those patients are health workers? And can you also give us figures for the amount of hospital-acquired coronavirus? Um, again, these are questions I can't give you the answers to right now, but on a range of these things, this is uh, the information we are seeking uh, to be able to make available. Um, as I've said uh, previously, when we've been dealing with uh, relatively small numbers, patient confidentiality has been uh, a much bigger consideration. As numbers unfortunately rise, that becomes less of a consideration. So we are seeking to make as much information available as possible, both about the uh, the, the nature of the spread of the virus, uh, where it is spreading, where people are picking it up, and, and also as much information as possible about those who are in hospital or in intensive care. And later this week, uh, we'll be able to set out some of the information that Health Protection Scotland will be able to make available. Uh, Gregor, do you want to add anything to that? I, I think just simply to say that we're very conscious that both from the, the reports in the international literature and um, also from the experience which we are uh, learning from, uh, from from colleagues further south is is that we're very, very aware that, 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 that um, the possibility of hospital spread is, is very real with this virus. This virus appears to love institutions and so it's something that um, myself uh, the National Clinical Director and the Chief Nursing Officer are keeping a very close eye on and we're putting into place arrangements so that we can try to monitor that on, on a Scotland-wide basis. Okay, thanks, Gregor. Muir Dickey from the Financial Times. Thank you, First Minister. Um, could you tell us uh, about the criteria that the government is using to measure the effectiveness of the cu current social distancing policies? And uh, so far, are the policies being more effective uh, or less effective than your initial models suggested? Um, I'm going to hand over to Gregor in a minute, who's obviously been very closely involved in uh, the, the modelling that we are doing. And we, I think as we spoke about last week, we are in a transition from computer modelling to modelling that is using much more real-time uh, and real-life data, which will make uh, those models more accurate and allow us to predict uh, with greater certainty uh, the compliance levels with social distancing um, and the lockdown measures more generally and how the virus is spreading. Uh, we're using a, a range of tools to try to measure uh, compliance with social distancing from uh, you know, attitude surveys uh, through to different sources of information that are available in Scotland and our modellers and statisticians are using that to uh, enrich the data that they are using. What we have said uh, repeatedly, and it's still given where we are right now, it's still important to say this, is that it is too early for us to be certain uh, what impact uh, the, the measures are having. And that is to do with the, the, the length of time that different stages of this uh, virus take to develop. So at the time these measures were introduced, uh, some of the people that are now uh, manifesting through hospital admissions, ICU admissions, and unfortunately deaths, will have already been infected uh, before these measures were introduced. So it takes two to three weeks at least for us to be able to assess uh, the impact and the effectiveness of them. And that's why the uh, review date uh, around Easter was uh, decided on when we announced the, the lockdown measures a couple of weeks ago. So these are things that our modellers and statisticians and scientists are looking at very carefully uh, as we speak. And I hope in the days and weeks to come, that will give us a much greater certainty about the, the spread of the virus, when we expect it to peak, and when we might then be able to plan our way out of the measures that are in place right now. Uh, Gregor, do you want to say a bit more about the modelling work that is being done? So, so again, I think the important thing to emphasise here is, again, once again, the First Minister has demonstrated her, her real grasp of some of the, the intricacies and the nuances in relation to the modelling work and the data that's available and what that tells us uh, at any one point in time. I, I think that um, over the coming period, we, we will definitely be seeing much more complete and robust data, which allows us to get a much clearer sense of what trajectory we are on in terms of that modelling. Um, up until this point, particularly in relation to compliance, we've been very reliant on data from contact surveys, from polling, to get a sense of what has happened to people's lives, how that is impacting on them, and what degree of contact they, that they're having with, with others. Um, over the coming period, what we will start to switch to is actually real life data in terms of the impact that those measures are actually having on how people are becoming infected, becoming ill, um, being admitted to hospital and, and, and um, going through the, the, the kind of hospital journey to ICU as well. Once we have that type of data, we'll have a much, cl much clearer sense as to the impact of these measures and um, what needs to happen next. 
Uh, as we've uh, covered uh, a briefing uh, before, uh, we have established in Scotland uh, a scientific advisory group, which is chaired by Professor Andrew Morris, which is drawing on the information coming from SAGE, the UK-wide advisory group, and making sure we understand that in a Scottish context. And uh, I would hope that in the days to come, we can, uh, at a briefing like this, go into much more detail about, at that stage, what that modelling and uh, interrogation of data is starting uh, to show us, because that will give us a lot more certainty in answering some of the understandable questions about how much longer uh, all of this is going to last. Uh, Tom Martin from The Express. Hi, good afternoon, First Minister. Um, just going back to the um, outgoing CMO, um, you're explaining in terms of the original statement that went out, I think, on the Saturday night into Sunday morning, and that reflected um, what you said, the information the government had on the House, and then the CMO later clarified that there had been, in fact, two visits. So can I just check, before that original statement was issued, the government had actually spoken to the CMO, and had she withheld or not told the government about the other visit, or how did it actually work? The, the query, as I understand it, was specifically about a visit uh, this weekend. Uh, the statement that went out was a reflection of our understanding at that time of the reasons for her visit that weekend. That reflected the, the understanding we had. Uh, she later made clear that there had been a second visit, and of course made that clear uh, at the briefing yesterday. So, you know, that's... The, the situation there, uh, what I made clear yesterday, what she made clear yesterday was that the reasons in a sense are irrelevant because there was no justification for her having been at the House on one or on two occasions uh, because it was in breach of the, the guidance and the advice uh, that was issued. And, and that is uh, the reason why she nor I uh, sought to uh, justify uh, or defend uh, that action in any way. Uh, Chris McCall from The Scotsman. Hi, First Minister. Um, there are reports today that many businesses across the UK will not survive lockdown if it continues beyond June. Can I ask if the Scottish Government is already planning to offer increased support in addition to measures that has already announced to support firms in the long term? Um, I mean, that's an important question, Chris. Uh, these matters of how we support the economy in this really difficult time remain under ongoing review. I, I think I've mentioned uh, at this podium before that I chair a weekly uh, subcommittee of the Cabinet specifically looking at the economic impact and how we support the economy. There have been uh, some uh, very significant interventions made by the UK Government that has resulted in uh, consequential funding for the Scottish Government which we have passed on uh, to businesses in full. Uh, but we, I understand absolutely uh, the extremely challenging position that businesses are in because of this. So we will continue to review, discuss with the UK Government um, and consider on an ongoing basis further support that business will require. Um, none of us want to be in these lockdown measures for a moment longer than is necessary. First and foremost, because the impact on individuals, on mental health, uh, potentially on other health conditions, is not one we want to have, but also because the impact on the economy is, is absolutely significant and will become more and more significant. But it is equally important that we don't prematurely come out of these lockdown measures in a way that simply allows the virus to spiral again, because that would have uh, a very negative impact on public health, but it would also have a negative impact on the economy. So getting the balance of this right going forward will not be easy for any of the governments across the UK, uh, but considering all of uh, these matters is vital in making sure we come to the right decisions about when and in what order uh, we eventually come out of these lockdown measures. But support for business remains something that we will uh, keep under review on an ongoing basis. Uh, Chris Green from the Eye. Hi there, yeah, um, there's a question for Gregor Smith. Um, I wondered, were you aware of the CMO's trips before Sunday? And if so, did you tell anyone? No, I can categorically say that I wasn't aware of any of uh, Dr. Calderwood's trips before um, they, they were made apparent to me late on Saturday night. Okay, thanks, Gregor. Um, Seth Carell from The Guardian. Precisely. Sorry, the First Minister. Hi. Just asking you again about your discussion yesterday evening with Dr. Calderwood. 
exactly what was it, what new information came to you, which led you to then believe or uh, decide that her position was untenable. Brian Taylor has suggested that a lot of SNP MSPs were being told by their constituents how angry and upset they were about Dr. Calderwood breaching the lockdown. Were, were, were those um, conversations part of the reason why you decided the position was untenable? Uh, no, I, I didn't have conversations last night with uh, MSP colleagues. Um, and it wasn't so much new information. It was uh, my reflection on the course of the day. Um, certainly, people had been contacting uh, me through email and, and other means. And it became clear to me that Dr Calderwood remaining in office, and the reason I had wanted her, if possible, to remain in office was about that continuity of advice, but that that was going to be a risk to the confidence in and trust in the government's message. And that was not a risk I, or to be fair to her, she was prepared uh, to take. So, you know, that is the, the reason for uh, that change, in my view, uh, last night. And it was based on an honest assessment of the balance, uh, as I said, I think to a question earlier on, yesterday I was uh, balancing two factors, both of which were important to me as First Minister in the management of this virus. Firstly, continuity of advice from a Chief Medical Officer who has been immersed in and integral to Scotland's response, and if at all possible, not losing that at uh, in the middle of the handling of a virus. But on the other hand, uh, understanding acutely the importance of public confidence in the messaging. And, and these were the things, and I'm, I'm just being as open as I can here about my thought processes, these were the things I was balancing yesterday. And at an earlier point of the day, um, I perhaps thought that, you know, when she apologised and made clear that her actions were unacceptable, then the importance of her continued advice would be the priority. But it became clear to me as the day developed that that would be a risk to the public message. And so, you know, these, these judgments are, uh, you know, they're my responsibility to make as First Minister, and I stand by them. Uh, but they're rarely, in these kind of situations, absolutely black and white. All of us in these positions have to balance a number of things, and I try to do that uh, in good faith, to the best of my ability, but absolutely focused on what I need to do to equip us to get through this situation as well as we possibly can. Kathleen Nutt from The National. Hello, First Minister. Um, I'd like to just go back to the CMO situation as well. Um, you said you have been very open at the start of this crisis. You said you might make mistakes. Do you think by standing by the CMO for much of yesterday that you have made a mistake? And can I also ask just about the, the care home situation? Are you aware of multiple deaths in other care homes? And should people who are worried about um, elderly loved ones in care homes, should they be thinking about taking them out and caring for them at home if at all possible? Um, it, look, in, in relation to your first question, you know, other people can judge whether they think I got it right or wrong. I'm, I'm perfectly uh, able to, to deal with that. What I'm seeking to do candidly is set out the basis of my decision making. These are, as I said to Sev, they are rarely straightforward black and white uh, decisions. Actually, in, in a different context, in a purely political context, perhaps the decision might have been uh, more straightforward because the traditional, you know, how do you spin and news manage and, and politically deal with something might have been more to the fore. Yesterday, I was trying to work out what was the best thing to do in difficult circumstances for the government's handling of the virus? And I've just set out the two things I was uh, seeking to balance and why my view on the balance between those two things changed as the day went on. And, you know, I, I can only be open with people about uh, that process of thinking and decision making. And of course, you know, people not in my shoes will say if they were in my shoes, they would have made a different decision. And that is perfectly legitimate. But I am the one in my shoes uh, and I'm the one that has to make these decisions and I will do so uh, with for the best motivations uh, in good faith and for the best of, of reasons and that's what I sought to do yesterday. Um, in terms of, of care homes there will um, have been uh, further uh, unfortunately deaths of, of people in care homes obviously we will uh, be uh, open about uh, situations like the Burlington uh, care home. Uh, no, I, I wouldn't uh, advise people to take their loved ones out of a care home. We have guidance uh, that has been provided to care homes about the management of 
uh, this situation and the care inspectorate is working closely with care homes uh, to support them as, as they manage this incredibly difficult situation. Uh, Jean, do you want to add anything about uh, the work that's been done with the care home sector? So the, the care home sector, we are. I am in constant contact with Scottish Care to understand uh, any concerns that they have. Uh, that partly informed the reaction we took and the measures we took to introduce that direct line of PPE ordering and support uh, to that sector. The care inspectorate, as the First Minister has said, is actively engaged with care homes across the country, uh, making sure that they have everything that they need in terms of expertise and understanding and where it is required, we can provide additional NHS expertise to those care homes in order to help them manage infection control and infection prevention uh, and to make sure that the staff there have the confidence, the training and the equipment that they need to do that. And all of that work is underway and will be consistently underway uh, throughout the period that we are addressing this pandemic. OK, thank you. And uh, lastly, Tom Gordon from The Herald. Hi there, First Minister. Um, just following up from Kathleen's question, um, you said you would leave it to other people to judge whether you had made a mistake. I mean, doesn't that just you know, add to this fiasco, really? I mean, it was fairly obvious from the instant that story appeared that Catherine Calderwood was damaged beyond repair, and you seem to be the only person in the country who could not appreciate that at first glance. It wasn't a delicate matter to balance. It was a stone-cold clangor on your part not to have got rid of her right at the start. Now, would you apologise for that mistake? Um, I am very sorry that this situation has arisen. I deeply regret, I've said that in interviews already this morning, I deeply regret that this situation arose. I, I beg to differ with you, Tom, as, as the one who's in these positions, particularly now in a, a unique and unprecedented set of circumstances, uh, there are different judgments to be brought to bear. Uh, we are in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we are in a, a fast-moving, fast-developing situation. In a different context, in slower time, it wouldn't have been perhaps the same consideration to lose a chief medical officer. But that was not nothing yesterday in the context that I'm dealing with just now. And um, I, I would simply say that I don't think uh, it was simply uh, as you, you put it. I had things to balance yesterday, reflective of the circumstances that we are in, I did that. The balance of judgment changed as the day went on, and I've set out um, pretty fully uh, my own thought processes and, and decision making. And I, I stand by that. But you know, I absolutely, um, I didn't want this situation to arise. I regret it, and I'm, I'm deeply sorry for it. That is all the questions. Can I thank all of the journalists for joining? And can I uh, thank those watching uh, at home? Uh, as I said earlier on, uh, this has not been an easy. 24 hours uh, for the government. I, I hope uh, I have managed to uh, give those watching at home an insight into uh, the issues that I was uh, balancing in decision making yesterday. Uh, but regardless of that, this is an incredibly difficult situation for the country and we are giving advice and it is important we continue to give that advice uh, for the reasons that we are doing so by staying at home, uh, by following the public health advice, each and every person is helping us slow the spread of this virus and protect the NHS and save lives. I'm deeply grateful to everybody who's doing that and I uh, look forward to uh, sharing more uh, information and, and more uh, up-to-date uh, information on uh, the situation when we join you again tomorrow. Thank you very much indeed.